The morning that Catherine died, I got a phone call. It was, there's been an incident at Sandy Hook School. All schools are in lockdown. So we went into the firehouse and I, and I saw Freddie first. He was in third grade, so he was right around the corner when it happened. How was he? Absolutely terrified. In that moment when he saw me, there was this realization that he was going to be fine, but his first words to me was, I can't find Catherine. <laughs> to say it was hard, to say that it was dark in Newtown is probably an understatement of all understatements. But the peace and the awareness of God's presence, this sense of, I am here, I have you. I have rarely felt it since. Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. Today, we are going to be talking with someone named Jennifer Hubbard, who is a writer and an author, as well as a speaker. And she has an incredible personal story. Now, you probably have heard parts of Jennifer's story because the whole world knew what happened on December 14th, 2012, with the unprecedented Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting in Newtown, Connecticut. Jennifer was one of the mothers who would find out that morning that the shooter took the life of her six-year-old, her beautiful six-year-old daughter, Catherine. We're going to sit down with Jennifer. She has an incredible perspective on what she endured, and she has some incredible and important takeaways for us about the nature of suffering and for really anyone who's experiencing suffering or who knows someone experiencing suffering right now, how to navigate some of the worst things imaginable. Thank you so much to our sponsor, Amen. Amen is a free prayer app from the Augustine Institute, which is wonderful. I use it almost every day because you can hear the readings of the day on the app, readings from sacred scripture. You can hear the gospel. It's in a meditation session afterwards. What I also love about Amen is there's other features. There's stories for kids on there. There's sleep stories. There's meditations. You can pray the rosary on the Amen app, but there's all of this content and it's free that will help you find peace in your day to day. Make time for just even 10 minutes with our Lord. Use the app to help you remember to do this and log in. You can just access it on your phone and find that peace and that connection with God in your busy life. Download the Amen app for free. Check it out on the App Store. It's free and you're going to love it. Jennifer Hubbard, thanks so much for joining the podcast. Thank you for having me. You are inspiring. Oh, thank you. And your writing is beautiful. Thank you. So I'm, it, I know our listeners are in for a treat. We're both out in Southern California. You're speaking at the conference. I just spoke this morning and you're yep. speaking tomorrow. What's your topic on? Sacred suffering. Okay. That's uh <laughs> Well, I think that it's I think suffering yeah. is something that we shy away from cuz mm -hmm. we just don't want to deal with it even mm -hmm. when it's happening. We really I think that we have a tendency as just humanity to try to skirt around it or rush through it or avoid it altogether. And I think that that's a huge mistake. Mm. Because I think that when we endure our suffering and the trials that were promised biblically, we come out on the other side with such a grace and such a wisdom and an incredible treasure that we wouldn't otherwise have. And so I, I, I try as best I can to share with readers or mm -hmm. people in audiences of just the beauty of suffering. That's such an incredible thing for you to say. And I know your story. Yep. Our listeners are going to hear your story. Mm -hmm. And so, well, let's start with your story. Okay. Um, tell me a little bit about your background and your family. So I, um, I actually was corporate through and through, I started in a consumer goods industry right out of college um, and was in sales and marketing, moving my way right up through the corporate ladder and um, ended up pregnant in Buffalo, New York, mm -hmm. of all places. And when my son was born, he was in the NICU. Um, mm -hmm. And I have to say, I'm ashamed to say it, but at that point in my life, faith was nowhere to be found. Mm -hmm. And I was, <laughs> I often say I was worshiping uh, uh, and myself. I, I mm -hmm. was my own worst idol mm -hmm. because I was so focused on my career and what a great career could bring me and provide for my family. Um, I, was, I was the end result of all of my work. And so when Freddie was born, he was huge. He was 11 pounds. And landed in the NICU. Mm -hmm. um, I was a I cradle Catholic, grew up Catholic with mm -hmm. a beautiful faith. 
um, that my parents gave to me a, mm-hmm. a huge gift. And so in that moment of back and forth to the NICU and, and, and just reeling with the fact that this was something I couldn't control mm. or buy my way out of, um, I found myself re-engaging with my faith mm. and building a new place in, my, in placing my trust in God. Mm. And so I packed it up. I literally, when, when Freddie came through um, his, his own, his first little trial, um, and he was home, I made a deal with God. Mm. Um, and in in my back and forth trips, and my deal with God was, if you bring my baby home, I will I I, I will start going to church. And you know, I think that I, I think that I had it all wrong. We don't have a deal making deity. We don't. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but I think that in that moment, he used that time and mm-hmm. space, and and my willingness to sit mm-hmm. in church week after week after week. To he just started moving my heart. Um, to this place of understanding that for me personally, and I, and I think that I, I'm not saying that women need to give up their careers mm-hmm. to be home with their kids. I think that families have to make those choices in the best interest interest of their families. But what I do know is I needed to be home with my babies. Mm-hmm. And so it, f- f- Freddie came home and I left my career. Wow. Um, we moved to New York because it was uh, split the difference between families and had nothing. We went from two really great incomes down to one in one of the most expensive counties <laughs> in the country. Um, and I think that in in retrospect, mm. as much as I was not happy about it um, and and really, even though it was my decision, struggled with what I had given up. Um, in those moments, Catherine was born, um, and I had... How long after Freddie? Almost two years. Mm. I had them, and I had just six years of of just being totally immersed in them. Not, a, not at all a coincidence, because there are none, but being able to just seep into seeing my children grow up and start school. Um, Catherine was one of the first graders that was lost in the Sandy Hook shooting. Um, And so at that point in my life, I just, it was, my faith was growing. Um, I had friendships evolving. Like when your kids start school, your network gets a little bit bigger. Um, And in those days and actually years leading up to, to the Sandy Hook tragedy, um, I had a friend who really sort of put this little spark into my faith that was already growing. I I, I was going to church and fulfilling my promise to God <laughs> of His bringing Freddie home, and I was teaching religious ed and like I I was a good Bible study girl, <laughs> and so to have to have December fourteenth happen and be had my child fall victim to a, a, a mass shooting in an elementary school rattled, rattled me. But I sat in the firehouse the morning that Catherine died. I got a phone call from, from a friend who was, was so beautiful in her faith. I just We would walk together and she would share her faith. And I was curious about how she had this this relationship with our Lord that was more than just mm-hmm. a deal, like quid pro quo, if I perform, then he, he will give, and back and forth. And my relationship, be- because of her, was growing. And so she was the one that called me. Our daughters um, went to school together. Same um, grade. Same grade, same classroom. And how did she know something was wrong? We had, there was a robocall that went out to all of the families. It's, you know, that standard practice, unfortunately, now in, in schools that if there's something happening in, in the school or school's canceled, you know, it was one of those typical, you get the phone call and it's an automated message of, you know, please, you know, we're dismissing early. And this day it was, there's been an incident at Sandy Hook School. All schools are in lockdown. And she, so Sandy called and she said, I think it's more than that. She had, she had been at the gym and she had heard rumblings that there was something happening at the school. They weren't really sure what it was. Um, 
the shooting happened around nine o'clock and we were, she and I were there uh, about 9.30. So it was fresh and raw. They, they were still bringing kids down um, to the firehouse. Sandy Hook School sat up on the hill, it sits up on a hilltop. And they had taught the children to walk down this little tiny driveway in the event of an emergency to the firehouse. And so when we arrived, we couldn't get beyond the firehouse. They had lined up the vehicles like little matchbox cars. So we went into the firehouse and I and I saw Freddie first. He was in third grade. So he was right around the corner when it happened. How was he? Terrified. Absolutely mm-hmm. terrified. He was standing, they had the teachers. How old was he? He was eight. The teachers were standing sort of in this big common area. They hadn't yet organized the response to this tragedy because they I think that they were still thinking of what just happened here um, police officers that weren't even Newtown based were rushing to the scene it, outside of um, Sandy Hook there had never been a, an elementary school there was Columbine but that was years before there was never an elementary school tragedy of this magnitude. And so there was no playbook for how to respond. And so FBI and and state police, everybody just on this little tiny firehouse. And so when I got there, um, Freddie was standing there. The teachers had all of their, they almost looked like little chickens. They had all their babies sort of (laughs) pulled into them and the teachers knew what had happened. Um, my understanding, um, I have not read the police reports. I did not participate in any of the investigations. The FBI would bring the families together once a week and say, here's where we're at, and here, here's what we know. I went to one, and I said, I'm out. I, I can't. I, I, think that, I think that people need to find a place of resolve for themselves, for their hearts, and for some families, there was 26 victims. For some of those families, that path to resolve was to understand what happened that day. For me, that was not going to be helpful. Because I had, I had just had six years of just innocence and wonder and awe that our babies bring us. And if I knew the intimate details of what happened in that classroom... I'd be wrecked. I think I think I would spend have spent all of my time thinking about those last what they say were three minutes instead of basking in the six years that I had. So I I I backed out. So all of these teachers, my understanding, had heard what was on had was happening because someone had pushed a button on the intercom to alert the rest of the school. So in that classroom where the shooter was. Where the shooter was. And so the entire school heard the gunfire. And it was, it's an elementary school. It wasn't a huge school. So regardless of, of a PA system, it, you're going to hear it. So you, you can imagine all of these people had just heard what had happened. They had to get the kids out of the school. All three minutes were broadcast? The whole thing. The, you could hear... You could hear My understanding, you could hear the gunshots, you could hear the response of of the 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 officers coming in. So you're hearing this play out, and kids are kids are hearing this, and teachers are full aware of what those noises are. And then you had to go through the process of getting the kids out of the school. And trying, trying as best you can to keep their focus forward and not on the, catast- the, the catastrophic outcome of glass and just sheer devastation. It's an elementary school. It's tiny. There were, there were maybe, a, I, I want to say, probably 100 kids in the school. To the little ones who left, like your Freddie, all of the the killing that was in that classroom. It was in the classroom. So they heard it, but they didn't see it. My understanding. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I know that, that um, Adam Lanza, the shooter, 
was in the hallway. And so... You, you, Shooting into the classroom. Yeah, he had gone from a couple of... Cla- he had gone mm-hmm. into Catherine's classroom. He had gone into another classroom. Um, I think that he he was he was killed in the hallway. Um, who knows? Who knows? It's a moment. I, I believe it's just a moment where just evil... Put it, it put its claws into that little school and into those little hearts, and all the more reason why us as parents, especially the ones where our kids deal with trauma and tragedy, like we just pull them in close, pull them in so close that we can we can combat that that just that touch of evil that they experienced. So they're they're all in this in this school waiting for their parents and i think the teachers were were waiting on direction sure they had had lockdown drills but it was never to this extent and um i looked over i saw freddy and his eyes were he's got these big blue pools of pools like and they were they were just there was terror terror in his eyes he was eight. He shouldn't have to know what terror is, and yet he did. And and I think that he, I I think that in that moment when he saw me, there was this this realization that he was going to be fine. But he his first words to me was, "I can't find Catherine," because I, it's innocent, and it is. Something we just tell our like, watch out for your mama, watch out for your sister, mm-hmm. and they take it seriously. And so he um, he was with me. Mm-hmm. Um, I had to I had to <laughs> literally check him out of the line. They when they got the when they got everything organized, they had lined up the classes in order, so they were kind of stair stepped in the bay of the firehouse. They had moved all the fire trucks out. Um, and it was really apparent when everybody was, it was Catherine's entire class that was gone. And it was, that class was missing. What age? Six. The six. Five and six. She was in, she was in first grade. So they, um, the kids were, the parents were coming in and they were collecting their kids and like just the panic and the, the sheer, it was almost like a numbness, like shock of I, what just happened here. And once the kids were reunited with their families, they took us, the families that lost, and we waited. Um, for what? What were you waiting for? Our children. We literally, we had clipboards. Um, we had to fill out our child's name and their classroom and their teacher. What was that like? Because you got there, you saw Freddie, you're probably looking for Catherine, and then they're handing you a clipboard. Numb. There's just, it's a numbness. You, 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 you kind of go through the motions. I never thought, you know, it's interesting that the day that Catherine died, she cried every single day, like, she did not want to go to school. She was she wanted to be home with mama and she would cry. <laughs> She'd get on the bus and I'd look at her and be like, oh, I can't. She didn't cry on December 14th. She she got on the bus. She was glowing, like lit- radiant. And um my neighbor, I remember walking up. We lived on a we live on a cul-de-sac, and my neighbor she sort of grabbed my arms, you know, kind of like moms do. The kids are off to school, and the moms <laughs> kibitzing, and she grabbed my arm, and we were walking back up to the houses, and she goes, "Oh, finally!" Like, "Oh," because it was heartbreaking for all of us to watch this little kid get on the bus, and they're little. She seemed big at the time, but they're little, um, and so it just. You start going into this sort of robotic action of what do I need to do next? What do I need to do next? So we sat in the firehouse and and I knew like I I didn't I didn't know then, but I knew in retrospect 
I, I remember getting in the car when that when when my friend called and said, "I think we got I think we've got to go down to the firehouse." I remember calling my house and talking to my dad, and he had said to me, "He goes, well, listen, because they had seen it on the news. It was breaking news all over the country, and you got to remember we're." We're there. We're not watching the TV, and we're we're like we're trying to get to our kids. And so my dad had said something just came through. I'm watching it on TV. Bring your driver's license. You're probably going to need your <laughs> your driver's license so that they can do whatever they need to do so that you can bring your kids home. So I remember grabbing my driver's license. I. I literally, I had on sweats, threw on my jeans and a sweatshirt, a baseball hat, and was driving to the school and and saying, oh my God, no. I think my heart knew. I think I think we know as parents. There's, there is a bond with our children that goes beyond any sort of reasoning. And so sitting in that firehouse, writing down, Catherine's name and her teacher and her grade and sitting there and waiting. They would they were giving us updates. What had happened was they were they were combing the school in the event that any of these little ones were hiding anywhere. Because they scattered. Like they these kids, they just in the classrooms that were that were most affected, um, some of the kids ran for their lives. And so they wanted to they and wanted, some survived. And some survived. Yep. And so they wanted to make sure that every single soul was accounted for. Um, what I now know, we were assigned state troopers. What I now know is that they were trying to identify so that they could then come and tell the families with a certainty of what had happened. So we sat in the firehouse. Um, I sat with my friend and we prayed. And I, I'm, I often remind people that we were built for fellowship. Mm-hmm. We were not made to walk this world by ourselves. Two by two, <laughs> on the ark, <laughs> two by two, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus <laughs> sent the disciples and his apostles out, like two by two, guys. And so had I not had this friend mm-hmm. that I had walked with and I had grown in my faith with, I don't know... If we, if I would have sat in the firehouse and prayed, mm. I really believe that if if you have someone that you can pray with in the seasons of joy, <laughs> you have someone to pray with in the seasons of suffering. But don't go f- try to find someone in the season of suffering. Like that's mm. not a great time because you're kind of empty. Not a good time to invest in friendship. <laughs> invest in friendships. So Sa- Sandy and I sat in the firehouse and we we prayed and prayed. And around, I want to say, 3.30, 3 o'clock, the governor arrived and told us that if we were sitting in that room, that our loved ones, because there were some teachers involved um, and some administrators involved, if you're sitting in this room, your loved one was a fatality of this incident. And what a sacred and holy moment. Because that room was just where grief and devastation and everything that everybody had been carrying was gone, like gone. I, for me, it was fatal. Like I literally thought to myself, fatality, a six year old's not a fatality. How does that happen? I had to go out and tell my son, I, "Your sister's gone." I remember he was sitting on a on a couch. They they had emptied the room when they made this announcement. It was just for um, immediate family or caregivers. So they, um, my son was out in the in sort of a common room. He was sitting with one of our priests who had come. And I remember going out into this room and thinking, now I have to tell him that his sister is gone. Like, ugh. And I remember saying to him, 
your sister, your sister died, but we're going to be fine. And just like getting up in his face and saying, we are going to be fine. And thinking, we're going to be fine. We're, we're, we're going to be fine. So I kind of gathered him up and said, let's get out of here. Let's, let's go home. Um, we had, uh, I was leaving. I had my, my key. Like literally, when I tell you, you kind of go into autopilot, I was, I was going to drive him home. And one of the, one of the officers was like, <laughs> You're not driving him. <laughs> so someone drove me home with him. I remember walking in the house and it was it was so quiet. Catherine's dad was in Europe at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, he was coming home that weekend. Work trip. A work trip. So what a time to be it was, away. And it was ten days before Christmas. So I walk into the house and they were very excited about Christmas that morning. We were going to make gingerbread houses and the tree was up and just the amped up excitement of it's we're we're in the T minus 10 day count of Christmas. Um, And I remember just sweeping, like finishing up the chores that I was doing before I went to school in the morning and thinking, what am I supposed to do? Her, her little shoes were by the front door. She loved animals. She loved them. And so she had these little play spaces set up on the floor that I, you know, all of a sudden what was an annoyance because, you know, it's like stepping on a Lego, like ugh, clean up your toys. All of a sudden these little spaces that she was playing, you know, she'd lay on the floor and she'd move the horses and they became artifacts that I didn't like, don't touch. Mm. Don't touch. And somehow you just go day by day by day. And some days you go hour by hour by hour. And here we are 11 years later. What was it like after you got that news? You said day by day, hour by hour. You're dealing with this impossible grief. I mean, yeah, I, I'm. I can't even, it's hard to imagine, you know? Yeah. And it's a national and international news story. Yep. I had no idea. I was, I was fortunate enough that my brother was in um, emergency response. He was a fire chief. He, Homeland Security. He just, he, he understood the magnitude of what had happened, and he drove through the night and got to my house and literally said, no TV, no phone. We were assigned a state trooper. It was the first time that that Connecticut had ever rallied in in some sort of incident of this size. Um, They had to think through how how do we deliver information and get information from the families? And so we were each assigned a state trooper. Um, fortunate enough that my husband at the time had worked for had, was working for a company that was so incredibly helpful and generous. They put security guards at the top of our up the top of our road. We were on the on the cul de sac, so they were at the top of the road. Our trooper was at the bottom of the road. Was this to keep out media? Media. media. To keep out media. So the this is an unprecedented school shooting. Mm. How many kindergartners and first graders so are it was, lost? So it was um, 21 first graders, five administrators, and um, people were curious. They wanted answers. And I don't blame them. I don't, I, I, I don't blame them. I think my tendency now, unfortunately, we deal with this far more than we should. My tendency now is to understand that media is important. It's important that people understand what's happening and the stories behind what's happening. But there's a point of human dignity that we have to give people space to think about and understand what exactly is happening. Because it's forever changing. It's not, I heard, um, 
someone tell me after, I think it was the Uvalde shooting. Are you in touch with those families? No. Um, because I think that they need, they, they, need they know where I am. Mm. And so I heard someone say it was a fast-moving news cycle. And I really, I struggle with that, that compassion and our ability in, in, as humans to have empathy and understand that how we're treating each other and how our kids are growing up is a fast-moving news cycle. I, but I get it. Like... I lived it. So we, um, we kind of had this really beautiful bubble around us. And the reason was that we needed to start processing our grief um, and doing those things that we as Catholics do to say goodbye to our dead. And I had to plan Catherine's funeral. And it was one of these things where that's what your priority is, not the media, not the interviews, just stay, my brother was, just stay right here. Like, let's just stay right here and let's just get through today and the tasks that need to get done today. Meanwhile, that little bubble allowed Freddie some freedom to play in the front yard and have his friends, like, all of these kids were traumatized and they needed, they needed to realize that they were still eight and they were, the, the world was still kind in their world. <laughs> The world is still an okay place to live. Mm -hmm. Like we're not gonna, we're not gonna bubble wrap, and we're not gonna fixate on this. We're gonna, we're gonna go through what we do, because I think what I've realized is the reality of all of this is I'm not the only parent who's lost a child. I'm not the only parent that has lost a child in a school shooting. And so, I think that, I, I think that, for Freddie especially to understand that suffering and grief hit our lives in profound ways. But life continues to go on, and we must, as best we can, rally the, rally the energy to go on. So he's playing in the front yard, and I was planning a funeral for a six-year-old, I mean, um, and going to other funerals because those were Catherine's friends. And so as best we could, we would map out who was doing what wake and who, when was what funeral. There were, there were at least 20 funerals that were happening in our town the week before Christmas. It was, to say it was hard, to say that it was dark in Newtown is probably an understatement of all understatements. That week, um, and you're having to plan a funeral. Yeah, completely out of the blue, in yeah. the, for the wor like for the for the nightmare. Yeah, for the ultimate nightmare. What was your sort of spiritual and emotional sense? You mentioned you were numb when mm -hmm. you got to your home, and there was this numbness, but then you also had this maybe peace. What, yeah. what were you experiencing yeah. on that deep spiritual level? There was a peace. That was so profound. And, you know, I, I think that when we're void of what we want, what we, our expectations, what our prayers are, when we're void of that, because I was, I was void, void of it. I was just trying to get through what needed to get done. The peace and the awareness of God's presence, I have, I have rarely felt it since, and I want it so bad. Like I, I spend hours in the morning, way before dawn. I get up and have this this quiet time. When people say to me, "I just don't have time to have that quiet and that peace," what? What a tragedy, in, that in and of itself, because that's where we encounter God. And I, I chase that all the time now because I had it. Mm. I had it in that week of just planning 
and and doing what was the next step. I wasn't thinking about what was going to happen in two weeks. I wasn't worried about did I have enough Christmas presents? Did what am I? My Christmas cards aren't out. Like none of it. Would all that all just it vanished. And I believe that's where God wants us. And I, I don't believe that he uses tragedy to get us there, but I think that my tragedy got me there, and I wanted to stay there. I've often said, I would love to go back to that desert, minus what got me there, because it was such a sacred space. I think people who maybe have suffered, but suffered with faith, mm. Maybe they can relate to what you're saying, yeah. but I think it's also mind blowing <laughs> for others, <laughs> right? To hear you to hear, to hear you say to go, you want to be able to go back to that time for the death of your beloved six year old daughter, your beautiful little daughter, I, because you felt so close to God, so so like right here, like almost this sense of I am here, I have you. You need not look, you need not seek, like, I've got you. Profound. To the point where I don't know how anybody goes through life without knowing that they are loved by a God that wants peace for them. Like He has plans for us. He has hope for us. He has a future for us. Like, hmm. To not just sink your teeth into that and say, yes, that's what I want, please. Like, it it was so, my faith in that period of time was so strong that as we moved farther away from Catherine's death, and I started getting my footing and I could breathe again, I would find myself really kind of going... (laughs) Going off to not that not and I'm not saying that this is bad, but mm. I would I would start thinking me again, mm. like oh what do I want? And I would quickly come back to this place of I I want to be so close to our Lord that like my nose is in hit like mm. show me where I'm supposed to go because it's way too scary to think about like I'd start thinking about hmm what's spring gonna look like. And then I'd, I would get scared, like l- kind of panic, like, oh, wait a minute, what does spring look like? And I would, I, I would literally be just, okay, God, like, <laughs> come back, come back. You know, it, it, just push and pull of really wrestling with my faith and where God stood in my life because I had sensed him as he wants to be. And I wanted that all the time. We're huge fans of Good Ranchers on this show. As you know, GoodRanchers.com is American Meat Delivered. They're a sponsor for the show because I love their meat and they love pro-life, pro-family stuff. So if you like to eat meat, poultry, seafood, or pork, if you like any of that, and we have a lot of meat lovers who listen, check out GoodRanchers.com today. This is American Meat Delivered because it's all from American ranchers. And now you know where your meat is coming from. This is high quality meat. It's delivered directly to you. You can get free shipping. You can set up a subscription so that you're supporting your local ranchers as well as enjoying delicious meat. I love their steaks. My husband and I love their chicken. They have the best chicken. You're not going to find chicken this good in the grocery store. And you're supporting a company that loves life and gives back to the pro-life and pro-family movements. So check out Good Ranchers today. You can use that code LILA at checkout. Go to goodranchers.com today and get your American meat delivered. So your speech tomorrow, and you've written about this, you have a book Mm -hmm. on this, Mm -hmm. is suffering. And you used the word earlier, sacred Sacred suffering. Sacred suffering, yep. Which I think is such a, it's so countercultural because we run from suffering. Mm -hmm. I think so much of our society is avoiding suffering. What What do you mean by sacred? Why is suffering sacred? I think is suffering is something that is guaranteed to us. So my first my first thought about suffering is why do we feel like it's a punishment when it's it's biblical? We will have trials <laughs> in this world. So in that sense, I feel like trials give us an opportunity to do 
one of two things. We can lean in to our faith. We can trust <laughs> that we, we will be brought through to the other side. Or we can fight against it. We can fight against our Lord. I believe that those trials are opportunities when we are just wiped clean of every expectation. And when we're on our knees and we really don't have the way, it's when God moves mountains and we can see them. We can, And so for me, that moment of, of God just being able to work in our lives without us like pushing away, like, oh, I got this. I, I really don't want to go down this road. When you're suffering, you kind of just go. And in the sense that God is with us, it's a sacred time that we shouldn't minimize it. We shouldn't try to skirt around it. We, we shouldn't try to avoid it. I think that, and I'm not, I'm not saying we should seek out opportunities for suffering. That's not at all what I'm saying. But when suffering does come into our lives, it, whatever, whatever way, shape, or form, we need to embrace it and, and sit in that season. You know, I, I, I truly believe that we are given things in our lives and we are we are experiencing we experience things in our lives to grow us closer to our lord mm -hmm. so that the fullness of eternity is ours and if we try to skirt around it we're going to we're going to miss the point i think it's no wonder that all of those treasures that we hold in the highest of esteem are created by some sort of pressure or some sort of strain. I, I, I recently read that pearls mm. are formed because irritants get into the shell of the oyster, and the oyster produces this beautiful thin wrapping around to try to combat the irritant. And I think so often that when we, when we have these seasons of suffering, that we're transformed through them. We grow closer to our Lord. And it's that thin layer that's created each and every time that we, when we arrive <laughs> in eternity, this precious stone to offer to the kingdom it's no wonder when people talk about heaven, it is adorned with everything. Gold, it's forged through fire. Mm. Diamonds, pressure, pressure, pressure in, in the coal mines. And yet we, we avoid that because mm. we think that it's going to destroy us. It's not. It's going to make us stronger and better and more beautiful and more resilient and more mm. able to say to our kids, "You, here's, I'm living proof. They're watching us all the time. I'm living proof that you can trust in our Lord in all circumstances, every single one. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the faith, right? The Lord. That's faith. Yeah. The Lord, but what did he do? He was crucified. Yeah. He, the ultimate example of the ultimate suffering that he endured. Yeah. yeah. And then he says, what does he say? Pick up your cross. All roads lead to Calvary. All roads lead to Calvary. Were there other people that you knew at the time or you've known since that you're you're kind of for want of a better phrase embracing the suffering you know mm -hmm. you're 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 letting it happen yeah you're going through it and were there others or have you observed other people who maybe fight it oh yeah and how does how did you see the difference in how you navigated the trial versus maybe others maybe they didn't have faith or they had a faith but they were angry mhm mm mhm mm and they just didn't want to, they didn't want the suffering. So that it was just rejection of the suffering. Mm -hmm. Anything to share about that? Yeah. I mean, I think when you have, when you have 26 families, it's a great case study for, for any mental health institution of here's the same tragedy and here's 26 different responses. The one thing I, I know for certain 
is those people who had a faith, who believed that this tragedy could serve a higher purpose, and that is for our Lord, for His glory. There was a gentleness about them, just a gentleness. Whereas the the people who just pushed back against it, this is horrible to say, but there was an anger that just never subsided. And I think that's because when you have a Lord who knows you and and knows that you know he knows you, and by that I mean giving him everything, you release it. You take what's what's weighing you down and all of those things that we are warned against by (laughs) St. Paul and St. Peter, like, don't do this. By Jesus himself, like, here are the things I want you to ponder. They're good and they're righteous. When what you're pondering is your anger Mm. or what you're due or the way that you're going to justify the death, that's what you become. And so for me, what I what I know to be true is I was kind of over on, on the camp of I'm gonna I'm just gonna kind of sit on all this stuff. And I didn't realize I was stewing on all of these sort of g- gross emotions. There was there was one night um, that I just I let God have it. I was furious. And I didn't. I was. I was playing, <laughs> playing the good Bible study girl. Like God is good, and we're going to be fine. And I wasn't. I. It was. Um, it was June of 2013. It was the last day of school. There was an author's tea that went horribly wrong in Freddie's class. He was reading a, a piece um, that he had chosen. It's the end of the school year tradition. You know, pick a piece of work and and read it to the parents that had all assembled, and we had all assembled. And here are these parents that, me, myself included, saying, thank God this year is over. Like, it's summertime. And summertime in my house was PJs and sleep Mm -hmm. and just let's go put our toes in the water and no, no, no rules, just us. And so I was so excited for it. And and this little T was keeping me away from that just Freddie and I needed to decompress. And so he chose a piece of work. And at the end of it, he looked at me, big eyes, and I'm sitting in the chair and I'm kind of looking at him and I'm trying to gather where he's at. And he literally, he like, we're trying to like talk to each other. Like, and I gave him the, just finish. Like, come on, let's go. It was the autobiography part about the author. I have a mom and I have a dad. And he had written this piece before he, before Catherine died. And he stumbled over and a sister. Mm. Because in an, eight-year-old mo- in an eight-year-old mind, it's, do I have a sister? She's not here. She died. So do I still have a sister? And the whole, the whole place just sort of collapsed. It was like the straw that broke the camel's back. Like, oh. Because they all know who we are. They all know that Catherine was lost. We get through it. Freddie took the bus home. I drove home. I walk in the house, and there were boxes. It was the last day of school. There were boxes on my dining room table, and it said, Catherine Hubbard, one of two. Catherine Hubbard, two of two. They were evidence boxes that they had collected, and they were trying to, to wrap things up. And they had delivered what was left in the school of Catherine's. That day? That day. And I was like, I, I can't. I couldn't even lift the box to see. what I was assured that Catherine's things were, they were handled with love. And that they... And this was six months later. Six months later. They had, at some point, they had to. They had to close down the investigation. They had to bring things. But Catherine, yeah, she had her backpack on her hook. Like all of the things that just, 
you don't plan for this. So, you know, it, the reality of, of all of it, her little pencil case, <laughs> her book, like everything, sh- there it is on my dining room table. And I had taken to going to the grocery store at night because I did not want people to see me. I didn't want people to ask me questions. I was tired of lying to people. They'd say, how are you doing? And I'd say, I'm fine. Freddie's going to be fine. How are you? And I wasn't fine. But that's what I did. I don't want to get into it, and I didn't want to talk about it. So there I am at the at the light, going to the grocery store. It was ten o'clock at night, and it just bubbled up in me this moment of just exhaustion. I had heard and seen too much that day, and I started mumbling to God, like this is ridiculous. Seriously, like I, this is what I get. Was I not? Was I not a faithful? And and a, a, a faithful and giving servant. I was teaching CCD for crying out loud. My kids, they they knew you, and I gave up a career for this. And this is my thanks. And I, like, got to the point where I found myself screaming in my car at our Lord as the light kept circling through. Red, green, yellow, red, green, yellow. And my just my litany of offenses that I had been offered just kept going and going and going. And at the very end of it, at this point, I'm weeping, like, snot's coming out of my nose. I'm just like mad, yelling. Like it's that fight that you have with someone where it's like you've held everything and you're like, I'm just not going to bring it up. And it comes up and I screamed, and you could have stopped this and you didn't. And at that moment when it came out, I literally, I covered my face because I thought, now I've done it. I've done it. Like, that's it. Game over. This beautiful peace that had surrounded me in the days after Catherine's death, it was gone. Like, I just blew it. And what happened instead was this peace that I write. I'm a writer. I, this piece that came into my life and into my car and, and just into my whole being, I'll never find the words to describe. I will never. It was, it was like that moment when your kids have a temper tantrum and they, you're, like, you're just taking it and you're taking it and you're taking it and then they say what's really on their mind and you think, <laughs> there it is. And it's like, it's out. It's, it's brought out into the light. And I think that's what happened in my car. And I think that, long way around the horn, but I think that the difference between people that have a true and real and living faith have the confidence to go to our Lord with everything and say, here, you take it because you're the one who knows how to deal with this gut because I can't. And it's not left to simmer and stew and just create this mire and muck that we just can carry around. It's a it's a going to. I love confession. It's a going to to say, okay, this is this is this mire that's in me and I'm going to kind of fixate it because I'm going to be shameful or thought unworthy. Here, <laughs> you, you take it because you love me and you don't want me to carry it. The people that don't have that I think, to this day, struggle with the death that they experienced in Sandy Hook of those Mm -hmm. those 26. And I often see them trying to go down paths of finding that peace. And the real peace comes when you can let it go. There's, There's no amount of money, legislation, or time that will bring our children back. And you know, I I don't know if I want Catherine back here. She's where I'm going. (laughs) It seems maddening to be like, oh no, come back here and live this this life on on earth. Yes, it's a beautiful life and we're surrounded by such beauty and, and God's creation, but this is not where we're meant to be. And so she's, she's where I'm going. You stay put, and I'll get there, <laughs> God, will, God willing. Because nothing, there's no amount of money, 
There's no decision. There's no action that's going to bring her back. And to think that there's something that's because her coming back would be where I'd have where I have peace. That's where like, you know, when you when you've got both your children with you and you're like, OK, I'm good. That's not going to happen. So to think that that would happen would be insanity. Well, and we believe in you believe in heaven. Ah, and it's all right there. <laughs> well, you know, I it's think all good there. I, I've often thought that if if we're if we're practicing our faith, and we believe what we say, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and that we praise and worship and adore a Lord who sacrificed His life so that we could have heaven. Why don't why don't we believe in it? <laughs> It just makes it makes no sense. It's horrible for us that are left. I don't want to minimize grief in the sense that it's it's goodbyes that we don't want to offer. But it's temporary. And I think that in that temporariness, in the in the sadness that's there, it needs to be honored. That's why sacred mm-hmm. that's why suffering's sacred. It needs to be honored. But we also need to know that there's there's joy and there's celebration and there's moments still to be had on this earth so that when we are all reunited someday, we can all look back and really know that job well done. Mm. You honor you honored. I I I really believe that someday, God willing, in heaven. I really believe that there's this moment where we will hear from God. Well done, my beautiful daughter. Well done, my beautiful son. Now you can rest. Thank you so much to our sponsor, Every Life. Everylife.com is America's pro-life diaper company. This is a company that has best-in-class diapers and wipes for your little one or your loved one's little one, and it's a pro-life company that gives back to the pro-life movement. So stop buying from companies like Huggies or Pampers that supports abortion and start buying instead from everylife.com and supporting a company and getting great products for your little one that actually loves children and life. Check out everylife.com today and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. That's everylife.com and the code is Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. Was there ever a time, Jennifer, where because you had lost in such a incredible, an unbelievable loss? Yeah. Was there ever, did you ever struggle to enjoy, you know, Freddie, for example? Or was there ever a struggle of, you know, you were kind of bracing yourself, you Mm -hmm. trusted God, you Mm -hmm. had this kind of deep level peace, but I don't know, there was sort of a sense of, well, the next shoe could drop. Mm -hmm. So I need to kind of be detached from Mm -hmm. enjoying life too much. Was that ever a struggle? Um, Yes, Hmm. it was. And I think in, in, in the sense of honoring the traditions that were a part of our family, um, those, those moments where I just didn't, I struggled with putting up the Christmas tree. Um, <laughs> do, you, do, do, do you do those, those things that are typically circled in red Sharpie on your calendar or not? Like, are they worth it? Um, and I, th- I think that in those moments, so we made bu- we made school buses, school bus cakes, for the first day of school. It was a riot. I'm not a baker in any <laughs> stretch of the, but it was a Pinterest board, <laughs> and I was like, I can do this. So we would make a school bus cake. First day of school, the kids would come home, and here was this cake that was hardly delivering anything to the land of sweets, and it was a moment where we just celebrated the start of a new school year. And so on Freddie's first day of school, as he was in third grade, so his first day of fourth grade, off he goes to school. And it was hard. It was so hard because, remember, I'm at home. And so our lives were just steeped in 
the traditions of these miles. There was a day that we went and got school supplies, and Catherine loved to get school supplies. And so, you know, no Catherine for that. And the first day of school, I, I'm packing a lunchbox, and I'm used to having two on the counter. Now I've got one, and I, I, can't let my son see me crying because he needs to know that he can go to school and I'm going to be fine. And so it was just, it's hard, hard, like to just muddle through life. And so I really debated if I was going to make this stupid cake and um, I decided to make it and it was horrible. I cried the whole time. It was the worst looking cake ever. My tendency could have been, that's it. Like, no more. Like, get the kid home from school. <laughs> I'm going to become a homeschooler parent. And I'm just, I'm not going to do life the way that I knew I needed to do life because it was too mm. dangerous and too hard. Mm. And I, by the grace of God, powered through that cake and in walks Freddie from school and I think there was a little bit of question mark on his mind. If I hadn't made the cake, there would have been no conversation. It would have been, how was your day? And, and yet he turned around and he kind of looked <laughs> and he said, thank you, mom. Wow. I'm telling you, the cake was awful. It was <laughs> horrible. But I think that in that, in, in that moment... He was justified in living. Mm -hmm. And I was justified in living as best I could in that moment. Did not need to be perfect. It did not need to be perfectly appointed. It just needed to be honored. Mm -hmm. I think that I have a very real sense of time. And the fact is that I could have bubble-wrapped Freddie and said, nope, but it's not my time. Mm -hmm. It's not my time to s sort of curate. And so my position with him is know, know whose you are and know that you can trust your Lord for your plans, for your hope, for your future, because I'm trusting him in mine. And the fact of the matter is, is that Freddie could die any day. I watched him go through driving as a teenager. Ugh. If I lost Freddie, I would be devastated. But I would be okay. I would be fine. Because I am fine. So did you, so it sounds like you thought homeschooling, you probably thought maybe should I leave Newtown? Like, do oh, I yeah. Just, the we whole completely thing completely changed the life, and maybe I don't know if maybe any of the families you know did that, mm -hmm. but I would imagine it would be the temptation of just like let's just totally switch let's this get out of here. We can't keep mm -hmm. doing this. Yep, but you didn't. No, no, and I think that I think that that is the I think that's the tendency when we're suffering. Like, let me figure out how to just get out of this. Mm -hmm. We're quick to make decisions. My brother said to me, "No decisions for a year." No decisions for a year. No job changes, no house changes. <laughs> like, just sit with this for a year. And it's wise advice mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. any situation. I think that we are so quick to get out of the situation. Mm -hmm. We are such an immediate society. Like, we can push a button and have what we want today. And it doesn't give us the time to say, is this really? Like, let's trust but verify. My heart and my gut is telling me to get out of Newtown, but Lord, is that really what you want me to do? Whereas I think that when you don't honor that suffering and you want so badly to skirt around it, you don't give time and space to our Lord to say, no, don't go. Because if, if, if I had done that, if I had said, we're out, life, everything is different, um, I would have missed out on a, on, on a lot of blessings and a lot of joy and a lot of moments where I just, to this day, will bow my head and say, oh, thank you, Lord. I, I have been afforded much that I, I shouldn't have been. I, we all suffer. 
We all have pains. We all have trials. And yet I am afforded these beautiful opportunities. When I landed here, I was like, really? Me? (laughs) Who am I? I'm a mom from Newtown who Mm -hmm. lost a daughter. Does not entitle me to such beautiful and amazing opportunities. Well, you're an author. You started a a foundation. Yep. Yep. And you're a speaker, obviously a writer. You write for Magnificat. Mm -hmm. I mean, you do. You you you're a mom, yes, and you also have all these beautiful ways that you share your lessons and stories of motherhood and loss. And um, what? Tell us a little bit about Catherine's foundation. So the Catherine animal lover through and through. I studied art um, in college. And so this whole animal welfare world was new to me. Catherine never wanted to get into my crafting closet, which was which was <laughs> always very hard for me to wrap my head around. But um, her passion was animals and she mm-hmm. followed it through and through. And so when we wrote her obituary, um, the question becomes, in lieu of flowers, what will you do? And so in lieu of flowers, the decision was made that we would ask for people to donate to the Animal Control Center. Catherine loved to go to the pound. Love It was like her event. And so um, I wrote the obituary and I made a typographical error. Um, I said, you know, I, I, it's a fill in the blank. Like the fam- in, in lieu of flowers, the family requests donations to go to. And I wrote the Animal Center of Newtown. Um, Inst- what is that? It's a rescue. I had no idea what it was. It was a rescue. Google search. Can someone give me the address for the for the animal As control opposed center? To the animal control, control center. center. So one is the pound, and one is the a private non or a nonprofit. Wow. Four women. They rescued cats. <laughs> I didn't know who they were. They didn't know who I was. We honestly they got a lot of they donations. Did. They did because I had no I, I had no idea of the magnitude and reach of the tragedy. Mm. And then to put out there, because they were doing bios of the children, this beautiful little redhead with this big grin, loves animals. (laughs) She rallied her kindred spirits like nobody would have ever imagined. So donations started pouring into the animal center of Newtown. And these women were over. Whelmed. They picked up the phone. They called us. They were like, you don't know us. We don't know you, but you are. we are very grateful that you sent. Don- and I'm like, huh? No, we sent it to the Animal Control Center. And they're like, well, we're the Animal Center. And we received over $125,000 worth of donations in a very short period of time. I think their annual operating budget was maybe $700. Wow. They showed up at the house. These beautiful women had, there was no restrictions on the donations. It was just, here you, here you go. They said, what do you want to do? I go, what do we want to do? I don't know. Like, who are you and Help what do animals. you do? <laughs> they were like, we, we do spay, neuter, and, re-. and I'm like, what? What is that? Like, <laughs> what, do you, what do you do? And they suggested a sanctuary. Mm-hmm. And they described it as a place where children would see their own innate beauty in the animals that they encountered. Mm-hmm. Um. And I said, I'm in. It was Catherine. The way that they, their vision of just children coming nose to nose with the animals that we would care for and their ability for children, their, to give children the ability to see their own innate beauty in the eyes. And, they, and it was, they had, the way that they said it, as they were saying, Children will see their the, their own innate beauty in the eyes of a lamb or a deer or a dog. I could see Catherine in those little those little spaces that she created, and 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 just she wanted to care for them. Mm-hmm. She just wanted animals to know she loved them. And in this sweet, innocent way, we we could honor that request of hers in a really big way. And so. I didn't know what we were doing, where we were going, what even, I had to Google a sanctuary. Um, And it's in Newtown. It's in Newtown. And children can go. Mm -hmm. We literally, I think that in that yes of sure, that's what we'll do. I believe I honored God's path for, 
for me to get through this. So in the days and years, it's now been 11 mm-hmm. years. I My intention was to get this thing started, have it represent Catherine, and move on with my life. It's been 11 years, and I have yet to be able to move on. But it's this beautiful, it's this beautiful place where God just shows up over and over and over again. We were given 34 acres by the state of Connecticut. Wow. We've got we have programming that has gotten into school districts. It's we we've educated 142,000 human beings on how to care for animals or the environment that they live in. The work that we do at the sanctuary is about ensuring that animals no human kindness. And mm. so we provide education and stewardship opportunities and where possible direct care to keep animals in homes and habitats. And the work that we're doing is translating into creating a more empathetic human being mm. in such a quiet and gentle way. When you care for an animal or you understand a purpose that an animal serves, something's unlocked in you. And we're mm. seeing kids that once they understand that that they have an opportunity to protect an animal that might live in their own backyard it becomes it becomes tangible they can do this and when you care for something it's really hard it's really hard to be mean to something mm-hmm. else and so yeah. my hope is that as we continue our efforts in growing the sanctuary and expanding our programming and and teaching people how to care for the environment and the animals that we share it with, that we create a, 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 a kinder and gentler world because God knows we need it. How can people find your writing, Jennifer? Um, well, I wrote a book. It's called Finding Sanctuary. It's on Amazon. Um, I'm in Magnificat, and I write for Alatea. Um, I'm in a hit or miss for Alatea. It's whenever they want to publish me, but it's about two or three times a month. Um, and... You can learn about the sanctuary at cvhfoundation.org. Thank you. We'll link to your Great. book. Great. And your writing in Magnificat is so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for doing yeah. that. Thank you for coming on the podcast and You're sharing welcome. what you have to share. I know it's touched a lot of people and yep. given peace and encouragement, no matter what happens, that the Lord is with us. I hope so. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. You're welcome. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast. Please check out Jennifer's work, get her book. It's incredible stuff. And as always, don't forget to subscribe. That's how the podcast reaches more people. And if you haven't already, join the Locals community. It's free to join the community, to just be a friend of the page at Locals.com. And we love our paying subscribers because that helps us produce more podcasts and keeps the show going. So go to the link in the bio, Locals.com, and we'll see you next time.